I read the word. Do you love Jesus today? Just thinking about those words, I think so often we brush past things to check off the box for the next thing. But I think sometimes we need to pause and just be in his presence and just say, Lord, I love you. I'm unworthy. I don't deserve to be loved. But he loves me. And because of that, I'm now able to love him. And so thank you guys for singing that. And now, as we turn to God's word in Luke chapter 25, excuse me, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, I'm going to read the text. God's word says, then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his, journey, on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. You may be seated. Well, my name is Russell McCutcheon, lead pastor of Reconciliation Church, and I am so glad to be here again on another Sunday to worship. I was reflecting today that God grants us weekly an opportunity as his people to worship him corporately uh, because we can't do this in isolation. Uh, Before I get to the text, there are a couple of things. There's really one announcement that has two parts. Again, as many of you have heard us say, and if you've seen on our website and even on social media, coming up in a few weeks, we are going to, as a church, we're going to get some exercise. We, we, well, I'm going to walk. Some of you ambitious types may be going to run. More power to you. May the 22nd at 9 a.m., we're going to meet, uh, for those who've signed up, to help raise money for the ministry corral, the equine therapy ministry. We're going to be, meet at Nightdale to do a 5K or 3.1 miles. And trust me, you can get your 3.1 miles in at Nightdale Station. It's going to be a great day. I'm looking forward to it, uh, to walk with my church family, to get some exercise in because the older I get, I need the heart to pump, but to also just enjoy fellowship and realize that what we're doing is going for young girls, who may have experienced crisis and having some issues that what we are doing is going to help them. We may not even be able to see them, but what we're doing is going to help them. Corral is doing great work. Now, an opportunity before that, a week before that, uh, this week we're going to have it, um, I'm going to make sure that this link is up on the website. On May the 15th, there is a, um, we have a work day at this Southeast Raleigh corral site. Uh, Some of you may love horses. I praise God for you. Uh, Not your boy. Uh, But we get an opportunity to go on this camp and work to get get an idea of what this ministry is, hands-on. I've already signed up. 
It's an Eventbrite link. It's free. Um, and when you see this link, man, I hope some of you will join me on, on May the 15th, Saturday. I think the time is 930. Um, just go out there, man. It will be done before, by, by noon. Uh, but just going out there to not only work, but then to hear from uh, the director of that site and what they do. Her name is Lauren. Um, but just to talk about what, it, what does it mean to partner with Corral. So May the 15th, work day at the camp. May the 22nd, we're going to walk, get some exercise, raise money for Corral. And I hope to see you there. Now, before getting into God's word, let's pray. Father, we are here before you. And as I heard someone say this week, I think it's true of us, Lord, we come with empty cups. We lift our cups to you and they're empty. Lord God, we need you to fill our cups. Not half full, but to overflow. Speak to us through your word, Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure I'm looking at some people who like nice things. Especially when it comes to clothes, right? You, sometimes, maybe some of you may be minimalist. But as my grandmother used to always tell me, boy, you got champagne taste but Kool-Aid money. Because I wanted the best, right? I wanted to get the designer clothes. And, and designer clothes, we know them because they have a special trademark that if you see that mark, you know what it is, whether that's Gucci, whether that's Polo, or Tommy Hilfiger, whether that's Nike. Everybody knows Nike, the swoosh. What, what, whatever it is, we know that some of these things, these clothes, they, they're designed and they have a trademark. They're very visible and identifiable. But similarly, we could look at people and see based on the attire that they have on what they do. We look at those who work in the medical field. We see him or her and see how they're dressed and know that, oh, you must be either a doctor or you work in the medical field. We could even see people like judges see him or her and realize that, oh, you, especially when you're in a court and see, oh, you're distinct from the rest of the people in the courtroom. It's identifiable. My friends, God has sent forth something as irrefutable evidence that we are close to God. There is a marker with us that shows and measures our spiritual growth. And this evidence is, dis is a display that we are his children. What is it? Four letter word. It's love. It's love. And Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 13, verse 35. He says, by this will, uh, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love. Those who are reconciled to God love him. Not only that, but we are then brought into a family. The church, the church is a family and the family is a church. In this family, we love one another. Now, family reunions, if you go to them, we all have a family member that we just don't want to be around too long. It's like, yes, yeah, something wrong with her. Some, something's wrong with him. They're going to start saying something and we don't want to be around them, but we love them. Why? Because they're family. They're family. This is the mark of, a, of the believer. And Jesus expands this uh, to show who else we show love to. He said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, he says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is that hard? Okay, is that hard, y'all? I'm going to love somebody I don't like. You're an enemy of mine. But Jesus, again, turns uh, this, this life that we live on his head. Um, it's almost like an upside down kingdom. The way that we normally do things, he says, no, no, that's not how it is in my kingdom. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. This is beautiful because 
God who created us loves us even when we were enemies of his. It goes on to say, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. My friends, today we are continuing to talk about reconciliation and what it means to be reconciled to God and to one another. The definition that we shared last week came from a book called Radical Reconciliation, where the authors are Curtis Paul DeYoung and Alan Bozak, a white man and a black South African. I want to, I think the definition we have it um, may be on the screen, but if not, this is what we said reconciliation is. Reconciliation can be understood as exchanging places with the other. This definition comes from the book. Overcoming alienation through identification. Solidarity. Restoring relationships. Positive change. New frameworks. And a rich togetherness that is both spiritual and political. Last week, we explored and looked at what it means to be reconciled to God. Today, we are going to start, begin to examine what does it mean to be reconciled to one another. Reconciled to one another. Also in this book, Curtis Paul DeYoung notes that first century congregations embraced a reconciliation that was revolutionary. The status quo was replaced by a qualitatively different reality. So what is he talking about? See, there was a status inversion in the church in the first century. As a result of the centrality of reconciliation between Gentile and Jews, this was cataclysmic. For Gentiles to fully reconcile with Jews, this is what had to happen. They had to learn firsthand the effects of marginalization for those who understood it best. Jews in the Roman Empire. We don't do that well. A status inversion, right? Being able to know what it feels like for those who are marginalized. That means we need to get in their shoes. See, however, in the 21st century church, it has been constructed on a different model than the first century church. The first century church was about reconciling two opposite parties. We are now under the lordship of Christ. We must be together. The 21st century church, we give lip service to it, but we in actuality live a different reality. Our model has produced segregated congregations and denominations defined by race and ethnicity. The first century church was about transforming society through reconciliation. But today the church, our church in the 21st century, seems to conform to models of privilege, exclusion, and prosperity. It's totally different. But J. Daniel Hayes, another author, has written on this where he says, for the church today to continue to divide along racial lines and to continue to maintain a racial division is to be out of step with the prophetic picture of God's future plan in which all his people worship him together as one family. Again, y'all have heard me say this. We know when Jesus returns, we're going to worship him together. No doubt about it. If you're in Christ Jesus, we're going to be together. But we struggle to do this now, and I'm praying that God will give us a movie trailer glimpse of that now. Lord, may we worship you together now. Because that's what it looks like to be reconciled to one another. If we say we are reconciled to one another, let's come, let, let, let's come together. Let, let, let's come together. Not just in like, oh, we're together now, but we're going to separate. But how can our lives be intertwined? where we really do life together, worship together, work together, just hang out at the park together, everything that we can do together. In our text today, we have the story of an expert in the law. He is also known as a scribe in scripture. So when I say scribe or expert in the law, I'm talking about the same person. And he came to Jesus to test him with a question. He came to Jesus and he said to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus then points him back to the law and says, how do you read it? He then says, and he answers correctly, love God and love neighbor. Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Now 
go and do what you just said. But then he wanted to justify himself by saying, then who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus gives us this, this parable that many of us know that we call the Good Samaritan. And this Samaritan was an unlikely person who would exchange places with the wounded man. Remember our definition, right? Identifying with those who are other and alienated. Solidarity. This is what the Samaritan does. He took care of him. The Samaritan shows us what it's like, what it looks like to love. As a matter of fact, the Samaritan had the strength to love. If we say we are reconciled to one another, do we have the strength to love one another? Do we have it? See, in the text, Jesus shows us that to love God is to respond to him on every level. Every level, not just one. Uh, the one level is the message of the gospel. What is this message? We have all of the scriptures now. We know the message of the gospel is that, that Jesus this good news, he came and took our place. He died for our sin. He was buried and then raised the third day. Now, if I'm honest, many of us love to stay there and say, I'm saved. He died for me, but no, no, we have to respond to him on every level because the next level is a loving concern for others. You can't have one without the other. One is orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthodoxy, right belief, ortho, orthopraxy, right behavior, right actions. Right actions point to ethics. Ethics is not a matter of abstract reflection. It's not. It's a reflection of character that combines listening to God with service to people. This is what we see with the Samaritan. This is what we see with him. And so the text begins in verse 25 with the expert in the law standing up to test Jesus. Let's not rush past that point. This is this is good. This is something that we need to pay attention to. Now, let me attempt to turn your ears to eyes. I, I need you to picture the scene because this was a typical Jewish teaching scene. We don't normally do this. Jesus would have been seated surrounded by his disciples and other hearers. So he is teaching and, and people are sitting around him. And if his disciple or someone else wanted to stand up, they, their standing up was to honor the rabbi and to speak or to ask a question. But it's evident that this expert in the law, this scribe, did not want to honor Jesus. He was trying to test him. His heart was not with Jesus. He was duplicitous for his intention did not match the posture of standing. He stood to test Jesus. And so he asked, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, this was not an uncommon question in their day. He, 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 he wanted to know what thing must I do. Now, I don't want you to hear in that works-based salvation. That's not what he's getting at. But he, he does want to know, what, what, what do I need to do to ensure? Like, in other words, how, how could he share in the resurrection of the righteous? And so Jesus responds with a question. Now, if it was me, somebody asked me a question. I don't know if you like this. When someone asks you a question, you're always trying to give an answer, Right? You're always trying to give an answer. You ask, you ask me that question. We, we don't even know how to say, I don't know. Right? We have just start rambling to try to get at an answer. Okay, I'm out of myself then. Um, just start rambling because we don't even know. We're just talking all over here. And, and instead of just saying, look, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Or to push this person toward knowledge to ask another question. This is what Jesus did. Instead of giving him an answer outright, Jesus then says, how do you see the text? How do you see the law? He turns to the word of God. And for me, this is beautiful. This is beautiful because it shows us that everything we need is found in the word of God. Everything we need. It's here in the text. We have it, the written word. 
And Jesus points him to it. And so the scribe responded in verse 25. I mean, excuse me, verse 27. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says you have answered correctly. You got it right, brother. You got an A on the test. But it wasn't enough to just ace the test. He says, do this and you will live. Many of us can answer the question on what is the gospel. The question is, are we doing what the gospel says? It's not enough to know what the text says. We must do what the text says. We do not have a faith that is detached from the actualities of life. Jesus didn't proclaim the gospel from heaven. He came to earth. He came where we are. Love God and love neighbor where we live. It was here on earth in the midst of our mud and dirt, our glory and grandeur that Jesus came. And so as we are living out this faith, this faith can't be so heavenward that it's of no earthly good. We need to live this faith out right where we live. An evangelist was invited overseas to go and preach and he was picked up at the, the airport. And, and so they're on their way to where they needed to go preach. They're on their way to the church, but they ran out of gas. That tiger was not in their tank. Because the gauge on the, in the car didn't work. And so he didn't know he ran out of gas. So what had to happen? Well, this man who flew to another country then had to get out the car with the driver. And they had to push the vehicle to the gas station so they can get some of that petrol in the tank. And, and once they got that gas in the tank, again, they turn their key. And it's, it's, if you ever ran out of gas, you know, uh, and I do my best not to ever run out of gas. I feel like I'm on E if I'm halfway. But if you ever been in the car and it ran out of gas and you got some gas in it and that mug turned on, the joy in your heart, like, whoo, I can get to my destination, Right? Now, the car was out of gas. Prayer would not have solved their problem. They couldn't have been in the car just like, let's pray, Jesus. From on high, I pray that you would send premium gas so that we could get to our destination. That that, that wouldn't have helped. Uh, As well as you had two Christians, two holy men in the car. Just because they were in Christ and holy did not put gas in in the tank. Something was required to make it run, and that was gas. My friends, many of us, we want to give God everything except what God wants. We want to offer God a little of this and a little of that and wonder why our spiritual engines are not roaring. God is what he is requiring. We are not giving. And that is a committed life. We're going to see that this this expert in the law, uh, his heart was not willing to give all of who he he is to people who are not like him. If we say that we're in Christ, then we are committed to him and we are then required to live that faith out. In the earth, if we are reconciled to one another, it's lived out with each other. So the expert in the law or the scribe uh, wanted to know how he could share in the resurrection of the righteous. You see, he was a privileged man. What do I mean by this? He was a he was a person who had access to the text. Uh, We will call it the Torah or the Old Testament scriptures because they didn't have New Testament at that time. And we have a printing press. We got Bibles in all kind of translations. They didn't have that. Whoever had a copy of the text, that was something who, who could get to it. That was something special. So he was an expert in the law who had access to the text. That's why I say he's privileged. He knew what God's word had said. He gave the right answer. Jesus affirmed that he read it right. But to inherit eternal life, he must do what the law says. See, our faith is worked out where we live. Not just on Sunday, 
Is your faith lived out on your job? Where you may have hostile people to Christianity. Is your faith lived out at the park with your kids? Is it lived out? We cannot compartmentalize where we live out our faith. Our faith informs every single thing we do. Paul was saying Romans 12, I beseech you in one translation, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? Not your mind, but your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your true worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that good and perfect will of God. But next, in the text, we are told a story. Jesus gives a parable because the scribe would ask Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I'm supposed to love him. Who is my neighbor? He's not asking this because he really wants to know. He's asking because the text says he wanted to justify himself. And in this parable, Jesus begins to speak about a traveler. A traveler. Because he said in verse 30, he said that this man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and fled, leaving him half dead. Again, let's picture the scene. Let's turn these ears to eyes. Because the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a tremendously dangerous road. Jerusalem sat 2,300 feet above sea level. Jericho sat 1,300 feet below sea level. The distance was a little less than 20 miles, and this road, which was narrow, was very curvy, and it was dangerous because there were caves, and bandits would hide in this cave, these caves to get these unsuspecting travelers, especially if you're by yourself, just go beat them up and rob them and take what they have. The text seems to show us that this man was alone. Now, in our day, we would look at that travel and say, why would you do that? You're foolish, right? We would say something like this about the traveler. If he didn't just wear a hoodie at night, he wouldn't have gotten killed, Trayvon Martin. We, we, we would have said that if he hadn't been out in front of the store selling CDs and resisting arrest, he wouldn't have got shot, Alton Sterling. Or, or, or if you had not been selling Lucy's or single cigarettes, you would have not been choked to death, Eric Garner. You see, we have a habit of blaming the victim. Have you ever done this? Have you ever blamed the person who suffered? See, this blaming can keep us at arm's length when God is calling us to love one another. Even within the body of Christ, looking from a distance, instead of being in community with and knowing the other person, we can look from a distance and begin to blame. See, you divorced because, or you're single because, right? We, 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 we can do this with a plethora of things, but we can tend to blame someone who is suffering. But love is what characterizes reconciled people. We love because he first loved us. The text goes on to tell us that two men, a priest and a Levite, uh, saw this man and passed by him. They saw him and passed by him. Now, what, is this, what this means is they went opposite, they saw this man, went opposite where he was. One of them seemed to get up close and then went around showing no compassion for him. Now, these men were probably going home after doing their service in the temple. So, so they did their jobs. They may have put in an 8-hour, 12-hour, 16-hour shift, um, lighting incense, making sure that animal sacrifices were being sacrificed. And so as they're doing their jobs, they are reminded that this is what we do as people of God. We're worshiping God. So they do their job to God in worship. And then they go home. But as they're going home, there was an opportunity for them to flesh out that other part of the gospel, loving their neighbor. But what did the text say that they did? 
Yeah, I don't know what's going on right here, so that ain't my business. I'm going on home. See, these men knew what God required of his people. They knew they were called to love God and to love neighbor. See, we don't need to to look past the priest and the Levite. We need to see ourselves in the priest and the Levite because we often know what to do, but refuse to do it. Especially in our world, in this reformed PCA Acts 29 world, we love the creeds. We love the creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the the Nicene Creed, whatever it may be. And we love to quote one of the creeds and say, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was dead, buried, very man of very man, very God of very God, because this is the truth about Jesus and it's good. However, my friends, we are not going to be judged by the creeds that we recite. We're going to be judged by the life that we live. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hail, straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. My friends, God will examine our works. He cares about the life that we live here on earth. And so Jesus telling this story to a Jew would not have expected for Jesus to share what he shared next. Because in this, in, in, in this expert in the law's mind, okay, a priest didn't do it, a Levite didn't do it, another Jew is going to come by and do it. But Jesus didn't give them another Jew. Jesus gave them someone that they hated. A Samaritan shows up. See, the, 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 the scribe would have seen the Samaritan as a villain. Oh, the antagonist shows up in this story. What is he going to do? Is he going to kill him? But the Samaritan doesn't hurt him. The Samaritan brought healing. The problem for the scribe was that Jesus showed the Samaritan to be the hero. And see, I'm thinking about this because in our world, heroes look like uh, Superman, Clark Kent. They, they, they look a certain way. James Bond. These are your heroes. We don't typically associate heroes with someone coming out to projects. We don't associate heroes coming from places like South America or places where, again, I'm just talking about where we live, where we as Americans look at communism and say, oh, can a hero come from there? We don't see heroes like that. Because heroes have to fit in our box, in our, the paradigm that we have. But uh, Jesus, I'm thankful that we don't have a picture of him. I'm thankful. Now, we tried to make pictures of him, blonde hair, blue eyed. Because, again, we have a way heroes look in our minds. Uh, but Isaiah tells me that there was nothing about him that anyone would, would want to say he's special. Right. I don't know what Jesus looked like. I'm willing to bet uh, that Jesus probably you just walk past him like, man, who is that? But Jesus was a gangster. He, he did. So my, my, my point is that the Samaritan fit that. That that place where the, the, the expert in the law was like, no, he should not be the hero. See, the Samaritan displayed all truism and selfless devotion to the uh, to the interests of others. See, he cared about others and notice what he did. And this is a lot that he did. Don't rush back. It said he came up to him, the wounded man. In order to help, we got to get proximate. A lot of times we like to help from a distance. Just throw money at it. And that's going to fix the problem. No, get proximate with what's going on. He saw him. Also, and I've talked about this before, it's so easy for us not to even pay attention to those on the fringes. Those who are not wearing the right clothes or, or living in the right neighborhood. 
those who are standing on the corner with a sign asking for money. It's easy for us not to see them. And then the text said he had compassion. And his compassion caused himself to act. So as far as it's being reconciled to one another, how many of us know what's going on with each other? Do you know the people who are hurting in your circle? Are you willing to get proximate with what's going on with them? Dare I say it, those of you who are hurting, are you willing to allow people in the space of your life? Allowing them to bring healing, not assuming uh, on them like, oh, you can't help me. See, this, this wounded man, and notice it, he couldn't say nothing. Imagine what may be going on in his head. So maybe this priest got up to the wounded man, and the wounded man can't speak, but he's thinking in his heart, like, I'm about to get some help now. I'm about to get some help. But the priest leaves. The, the sorrow in his soul, because now the help that was near, this person refused to help. But then here comes a Levite. Maybe he's hype again, like, oh, man, somebody's about to pick me up and take me where I need because I can't do for myself right now. I'm just in a bad spot. But then the Levite leaves. How many people around us we get close to and they may not be articulating what's wrong, but they are hoping down in their souls. That you would stick around. That you would be that arm of healing in their life. But then the text says this. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds. He poured on olive oil and wine. Now see in that it cost him something. Right? This could be equivalent to us uh, uh, coming out of our pocket, which we're going to see he did that later, or getting going in our house, getting the things that we have to make sure that this other person has. It says he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him, but it doesn't stop there. It says the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper to make sure this man was cared for. In context, this was about two weeks of care every day. Here you go for this brother. Then he says, take care of him. And when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever else extra you spent. This Samaritan was committed to the healing of this wounded man. Are you committed to the healing of your neighbor? If you're reconciled, if you're in Christ and reconciled and we're reconciled to each other, are you committed to your neighbor's healing? Are you committed? See, the priest and the Levite cared more about their work than for the man who needed help. Likewise, we must be careful about caring more about what we believe than human suffering. Don't nobody want to know about if you're reformed or uh, Arminian. When they're in crisis, no one wants to know if you know who John Calvin is or Martin Luther. When they're in crisis, they want to see us live out this faith that we say that we have with them. See, we must marry word with deed, faith and works. Also, when it comes to, to, to human suffering, we have to be careful about the paralysis of analysis. What do I mean? We can be paralyzed by wanting to get all the details. First, I need to know what's going on before I help you. How did you uh, go in the red in your bank account before I give you some money? How, how, what, what's going on? So why did you go get beat up? Did you drive in the wrong neighborhood? Paralysis of analysis. Sometimes we, it ain't our job to analyze and get all the answers as to why. When we clearly see that there is a need. Now, there may be a place for that. That's not what I'm saying. But often if we always use like, man, I need all the details before I can help you. Then often we would never help. We would never help. If we are the people of God, reconciled to God and reconciled to one another, we must look like it. And a, recognize, a reconciled people, the attribute that we have is one of love, loving our neighbor. If you come to my house, there are many pictures in my house. and We have a lot of pictures that are not put up on the wall. I'm sure most of your houses are like that. 
you have a photo album, and then you have the photos that you want people to see, right? Um, not saying that the photo album doesn't have good pictures, but you know, we just have, we, can, we can't put pictures everywhere because our house will be plastered with pictures. If you come to my house, a lot of people would be in my house and they would see the pictures of my children. They may see an 18-year-old me and the 18-year-old Zion, my son, and say, wow, y'all look alike. They may see my daughter. And you see my daughter like, oh my goodness, Russell, she looks just like you. And when people say that, I'm like, yeah, you're right. There's no way I can deny these. They are for sure my children. Why is this? They look like me because of a DNA connection. There's a DNA connection. See, my essence was transferred to them. And in the process of development, they wound up looking just like me. My friends, we have the DNA of Christ. Are we living like we look like him? As those who are reconciled to God, we ought to live like we are reconciled to one another. But often we look like the priest and the Levite. We allow barriers to keep us from other people like race. But reconciliation transcends national and racial barriers just as giving and receiving mercy transcends national and racial barriers. The Samaritan was not a Jew, yet he was willing to help a man who was not like him. Why? Because the Samaritan had God's heart. That's what we see in the text. The Samaritan had the heart of God. The Samaritan shows us that we can be used to comfort the hurting. He was a neighbor. See, we tend to always think of a neighbor as a noun, like who lives next door to me? That's my neighbor. But Jesus is not making neighbor a noun. He is making it a verb. Are you neighboring well? Are you a good neighbor? To be a neighbor is to assist others regardless of of race or any other barrier. But again, sadly, we allow barriers like racism and classism to hinder us from being neighborly. And Jesus says, talk about who is my neighbor? We know in scripture, that's anyone we come in contact with. My friends, we can't engage in reconciliation on our own terms. And I say this lovingly, but we need to understand this As we matriculate in society, those in dominant culture often want people in subdominant cultures to come to them in places where they feel comfortable and in control. Those in dominant cultures don't often want to go into the space of subdominant cultures where they have no control and to submit and come under. They often want to get get to places that are multicultural without going through the process of reconciliation. We're going to talk about that next week when we look at Zacchaeus, because there's a lot there. Just like first century congregations, status inversion is vitally important to reconciliation, especially for those who are privileged. This story is a beautiful story. It moves us beyond ourselves to care for someone else. This is what reconciled people do. My friends, a private faith cares only about itself. But our faith is personal and communal. This means that my life has consequences not only for myself, but for everyone else in other people's lives have consequences for me. So I end as a person who's reconciled to God. Will you be a good neighbor in this body? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you and we praise you for who you are. Lord God, I thank you for what you've given us in your word. How you continue, Lord God, to to expose us and to share with us your heart. Lord God, may we look at the example of the Samaritan 
thinking about who we are as reconciled people within the body. And I pray that we will have the strength to love our neighbor. Strength to love those who are my brother and sister in Christ. Strength to even love our enemies. Help us to be witnesses in this world, Lord God. Through word and deed. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.